My name is Pat Helland. I've been building distributed systems, databases, transactions, uh, messaging systems, multiprocessors since 1978. And so a lot of things have changed since then. At, at that time, Jimmy Carter was president, and at that time I had hair. And so we're going to have to move ahead now. Now these are some thoughts I've had on how storage and computation are evolving and how they can lead to interesting challenges. I'm going to go down a little bit. Okay. So these are my personal observations. This is not actually to do with Salesforce. It's just how I think about things. And I do, for recreational reasons, write papers, including this one. And so this paper is one of a number that I've published in Communications of the ACM. If you like this topic, you can go just you know, search for it online. And there's all, everything I'm going to tell you today is in a paper, And so if you care. So introduction. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about what state is. What's this state stuff? We're going to talk about how durable state semantics have evolved. We're going to talk about session state semantics and how that relates to transactions, some of the work I did in the 90s, how that's evolved away, how microservices impact with that. Identity, immutability, and scale. How do they work together with this crazy systems we're building? Walk through some example application patterns. So I want you to see that the patterns are real. What we're doing in here have different implications based upon what business needs and the conclusion. And the big takeaway here is different business needs cause different systems to be built. And so there's no one right thing. It's not one size fits all. So trends in storage. Storage has evolved. Used to be you had a computer, it had a disk, it had some stuff, and you used it. And that was it. It was all you had. That's all she wrote. Then you had shared appliances like a storage area network. Then you started having clusters in the network. And then even REST APIs over microservices. In my mind, that is an aspect of storage. It's a way of thinking about it. One of the things that's interesting about that is the app becomes the store. And so that's a piece that it, I think is fascinating. We won't dig into it too much today. Computing has evolved. Back in the day, there was a single process, a single mainframe region on the big mainframe. Then you started getting multiple processes in the same server. You could work with your app, and how did they talk to each other and work together? Then you, you know, what does it mean to do an RPC across a tiny cluster? I was there watching these things begin. What does it mean to call the computer that's plugged in next to the first computer? How does that work? Services and service-oriented architecture. I was the first one that I know of who was talking about what the, at the time I called a fiefdom, a protected environment with its, with its own data, and you would call into that app and it would do the data stuff. And that's today a service-oriented architecture. It's evolved or devolved or both to microservices. It's both. And so how does that fit together with this world? Um, microservices with little or no state, what are they like? Now, computing's use of storage has evolved. With this direct file I.O., you used to need to do careful replacement. We're going to talk about careful replacement. Careful replacement has a couple of variations. What that means is, first of all, if I do a write and it annihilates the contents of what I'm overwriting before it makes it good, which happened back in the day, right? So you would have the old value, then you'd have trash, then you'd have the new value. If that happened and I needed one or either the old or the new value to put it all back together, I'd have to write somewhere else and then come and recover it. So that's the first one. The second is that the client crash might interrupt a sequence of writes, and I've written two out of five things that I need to write, and now what happens if I only have two out of five after a crash? How do I put that together? Now transactions, I had a lot to do with transactions. I've been working on them since 82, no, 78 really, right? How did this transaction stuff fit together? And it provided careful replacement for the app. It was great. You'd say, begin transaction. Here's a bunch of stuff. Do it all in transaction. I'm a happy guy. You didn't have to worry about it being half done. That was huge for people writing the apps, right? And so it provided the stuff that took care of that plumbing underneath of trashing the disk when you were doing a write. I know, because I coded some of that. Later, SANS were providing the storage area networks, big arrays, which looked like a big disk, were providing you know, battery backed up RAM and stuff like that, so you could actually not have to worry about trashing the contents. And then you get into stateful two-tier and n-tier transactions, and how did that work? Now, we've grown to the point where that doesn't scale. So people are saying, hey, let's do a key value store. And you don't have to worry your head about where this key stuff is. You just come at it. We'll figure out how to find it. We'll update the key and the value. But you can't do two of them together. If you do two of them together and get a transactional behavior, well, we'll move one of the keys and it'll be broken later. So that's not so good, right? Now, REST puts, they invoke app code. But who knows what that does to the state? That's a whole other talk, right? So there are challenges in modern microservice-based apps. 
Today, microservices um, power many scalable apps. There's pools of, of equivalent services. Incoming requests are load balanced across the pool. I love this picture. This is from the 2007 SOSP paper on Amazon Dynamo. I helped with the initial design of Dynamo. I didn't write the paper. And one of the things that they're articulating is client requests come in, they're, they're spread out a bunch of pool of equivalent servers. At the time it was not, it was full servers, but it's the same as what you're seeing with microservices today. And then you would call something which would go through request routing out to another pool of equivalent servers, and then do it again to another services, and each of those services, their pool would have access to its own storage, which probably was built to be scalable, right? And you have the semantics of that. So the load balancing across that meant the second or third request was not guaranteed to hit the same computer. That's huge. It's huge in the ability to build and deploy systems. It's also a real pain in the rear when it comes to state semantics. We're gonna talk about that. Microservices must support many operational needs. For example, there's health-mediated deploys. That's known as canaries. So with a health-mediated deploy, deploy, say I've got 100 computers doing the same work, and sometimes it's not enough, I can add another 20 to get 120 servers doing the same amount of work, right? If that's too much, I could pull it back to 80, as long as my response time is managed in terms of tra traffic onto that stuff. When you're rolling out new software, it could break things, and you got 100 of them running, you don't install it on 100 of them at once, you install it on five, and then you stand back and you watch. How'd that do? Is everybody happy? Things getting sad? We're getting complaints? Nah, how about another five? And you'd roll it out. That's called canaries because coal miners, back before they had things to sense methane, would bring little yellow birds into the mine when they're digging coal. And when the canary would go thunk, then you would say, uh-oh, and you'd get the heck out of the, out of the coal mine. And that is why they're called canaries today in this system. Microservices are phenomenal for helping with health media, de helping with health media to deploy in canaries. So rolling upgrade, you want to support fault zones. You don't want to break multiple fault zones with the first tentative stuff. And you need to be able to design this for fault tolerance. Durable state is not usually kept in microservices because you can't easily get that state atomically updated. You have to kind of roll it out like you did the software, especially when these things are coming and going and crashing and restart. It's even hard to get something went down and went back up and it missed the new version of the software or the new version of the data. So typically the latest state is kept elsewhere and versions are cached and sometimes you read through the requests to the place you kept it. Like in here, you're going back down to these Dynamo instances to get the state that you need for that. It's the typical stuff. So what is this state stuff? What's it mean? So when I hear about durable state and session state, when I hear durable state, I think the stuff is remembered across requests and the stuff survives when things break. Now, there's a whole question I'm not going to dig into, which is how durable is durable, right? Can you read it subject to computer failure? Can you read it subject to data center failure? Can you read it subject to thermonuclear exchange, right? It's, it's all of these questions about durability need to be considered. But I'm saying kind of this, does it survive a system crash, a single node failure, is what we usually think of for durable state. And again, there's a broad discussion there. So databases, file systems, key value stores, caches are all that way. How is it updated? Is it updated with a single update? Is it updated with a transaction? Is it updated with a distributed transaction? Do I, can I, could I, should I have careful replacement? And if so, what's the granularity of the pieces I have to replace? We're gonna talk about that a lot. Do I need messaging semantics to update the various parts of the data with the state that are there? The next really interesting question, can you read your writes consistently? If I write to the store, and I go back and I read it, do I see that latest thing that was written? That's known as linearizability because the key value, if you will, think of it as key value, the value goes through linear updates, one after the other after the other, okay? And weakly consistent stores and caching make it hard to do read your write. You don't necessarily get the answer you wrote most recently. Next, we have session state. Session state is stuff that is remembered across a session two computer soft pieces of programming talking to each other, but not necessarily across crashes. So session state exists within the endpoints associated with the session. Multiple operations end up being a form of session state. Session state is hard to do when the second request to a microservice doesn't necessarily land in the same place as the first. So does that make sense? 
you're remembering what I'm saying to you as we talk, but I'm actually going to come back and talk to your twin brother, twin sister, okay? That's not easy to do. We don't usually do that, right? And so it's difficult, different microservices can get different stuff, and so session state kind of falls away when you have microservices. Now, what's data? I wrote a paper in 2005 called Data on the Inside versus Data on the Outside. And I was trying to point out, back in the day, the only data we talked about was inside the relational database. That's all it was. And if it wasn't in there, that was like, whatever. We don't want to think about that. Don't worry our pretty little heads about it. Now, um, the tables, the rows, the columns, the values within the cells are what we thought of. And that data lives in one place, the database, and one time, the transaction. Transactions provide this ordering. That's actually called serializability. Can I make the entire database look like one thing after another happened? It doesn't have to be serial. It has to be such that it's serializable. So if you update this and I update that, I can put them in one or the other and I can make it look like one thing at a time happened. Loosely translated, the programmer doesn't see change underneath them during the transaction. All phenomenal stuff all getting orders of magnitude more crazy as we get bigger into distributed scalable systems. But that's what it was. That was all we did back in the day. And we pushed it till it was fallen over, you know, and it was, Captain, she's going to blow. And now you've got the other things to think about because we've broken that ability to make that easy. There's ways to mitigate it, but it ain't magic. Data on the outside is different. Messages, files, events, key value pairs. Those scalable key value stores don't offer transactional serializability, so the ordering is different. It's not data on the inside, it's data on the outside. Unlocked data is not stored in the classic database. But what I've observed is that the act of unlocking it means you atomically get, you actually get identity and optional versioning immediately when you, you know, adopt that stuff. When you unlock it, it becomes ident with identity and versioning. Outside data is immutable but may be versioned. Each file message key has a unique identifier. That might be a URL, might be something else, might be implicit on the session, but there's a thing that identifies it now that it's popped out of the database. How has durable state changed? Well, we used to have to do careful replacement. I had to code this way back in the day, way back in the day. Used to be disk writes might trash a block. You would see old value, unreadable trash, new value, a power failure was a real mess because you'd wake up and that block was nothing. You didn't have the old value anymore. You didn't have the new value. So imagine the following. I'm updating version one of the file. The act of updating the block creates trash, and then I get version two. A power failure in the middle left me stranded and doomed. So careful replacement for a single block, right, with mirrors, what we coded, what I ended up coding, was when you write the new value into some other place, a parallel file, so I have two parallel files, I got mirrors, I write it into the first one, I get it there, now it's there, great, I'm good, I got it. If we power fail, I got the, the first file. And then I write into the second one, and then we're good. And that way there was no window of time in which a power failure left it unreadable. If I came up and one of them was unreadable, I'd rewrite it so I could get it to be good again. Careful replacement with a single block writes for non-mirrors, so you could do this game when it wasn't with mirrors, where you'd write to a different block, you'd get a new version on the different block, you'd come back up with that new version, and then you'd write it back out, and now you didn't lose things. The point I want to make is that you had to walk through this, it was like walking one step at a time across a creek, where you had to have one foot on solid ground because things would go awry. We still have it, different granularity. We'll talk about that. Careful replacement with record writes. So, Updates to records in pre-SQL databases had to be carefully ordered. In many cases, an update to one record, X, before updating Y, allows the record, the application to recover. So if I update record X before Y, I can figure it out after a crash. If I update Y before X, I'm doomed. A great example of this is an application queue. If I write a record in the queue which says, I'm going to do this stuff to the database, and then I commit. And then I read that and I do the stuff to the database in a fashion where if I crash part way I can restart it, that gets me out of this. It's a careful replacement, but the granularity is records in the system, whatever system it is, values and key values, whatever it is. It's a way of walking your way forward and knowing how you stand and can recover. Transactions bundled and made this awesomely easier for decades. They solved careful record replacement because you could wrap a bunch of records together. I could say begin transaction, change 20 records, end transaction. I never got 19, I never got one. I always got zero or 20. 
and that was huge. Solved a lot of problems. It solved careful storage replacement because when writing to the physical disk, the database and the transaction system made sure to cover this. I'm going to write it in this block and write it in that block. You, Mr. Application Programmer, don't have to think about it. Huge, huge. Working across time, though, oh my gosh, I want to do some stuff and then wait till something happens and then do something else. That was multiple transactions. So I had to think about how do I record my state while waiting for the event that's going to move me to the next state. So I have a careful replacement action in order to move transactions across time. But I'm still careful transactional replacement. And finally, working across space and working across trust boundaries, company A talking to company B, I have to do a transaction and remember, I'm going to ask him to do this, I'm going to figure out how to do that, he's going to do this, we're going to walk our way forward and restart and redrive when needed. It's all the same kind of stuff we've seen. Yogi Berra said it's deja vu all over again. When I see this careful replacement, I think back to my youth when I had to worry about trashing the disk blocks. That makes sense? So messaging semantics are pretty cool. Transactional message is pretty cool. I can do transaction one. I can write down transactionally. I want to send a message. And I could atomically consume a message. It, I could do transaction two, which says, yeah, suck up the message and do these changes. I can make sure it's exactly once. How do I do that? Well, when I do this, I keep trying until I hear it's been sent. That's at least once delivery. And then I do at most once consumption, at most once processing. But this has got some un undiscussed challenges to do at most once processing. I actually have to remember the messages I've received. Now that may mean I know I'm talking to 20,000 different partners and partner number 17,942 has sent me 531 messages, but that actually doesn't scale over time. And so I argue and I see in real application systems, this works by aging things out over time. You may, let me give you an example. You all know when you write a physical paper check, if any of you still do, right, that that paper check is an expiration of a year and it has a physical number. It's check number 103. So the bank will remember for a year that check number 103 has cleared. That allows them to be idempotent. If it bounces and comes back or resubmits, re re they'll only process it once. But there is a window of time because they don't want to remember infinite state to ensure at least once delivery. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All this junk weaves together. So how do you remember the messages? You've got to detect the duplicates. How long? Does the destination split? If I do this for a server and it's actually to a particular piece of state on the server and I cut it in two, how do I manage that? This scalable computing stuff is really hard while guaranteeing at least once. This one's really interesting. Read your rights, yes or no. Used to be back in the day, if you wrote something, you could read it. You know, it used to be when I was a kid, if you picked up the telephone, there was a dial tone, but you had a wire to the wall, okay? Linearizable stores offer read your writes. So if I write X to be value 20 and I go to read it, it's going to be 20 until there's another completed write that takes it to 21 or whatever, right? Linearizable means occasional delay for a long time when a server is sick or dead. Let me say this again. If I'm going to have a store which handles normal triple failures behavior in the database, or even if it doesn't handle triple failures, sometimes I go to change it and it will be slow. Why is it slow? One of the three computers died and the rest of them are saying, is he dead? I think he's dead. Would well, you think he's dead? I don't know, is he dead? Before they decide to kick him out and then move on, right? Or one of the three will be garbage collecting or something. Servers have this incredible low latency until they don't and then it spikes aggressively. If you have the ability to read your rights in a store, I assert for discussion, and we can debate it in a break, that you have a, most systems that implement that will offer delays sometimes. So that's a challenge to be considered. So do you get fast predictable reads, fast predictable writes, and read your rights? In a linearizable store, I argue you don't get fast predictable reads and you don't get fast predictable writes, but you can get read your rights. The reads are not as hard, the writes are harder. A non-linearizable stores do not offer read your writes. A non-linearizable store, there's no guarantee the write will update all of the replicas, might up read an old value. Reading and writing have a very consistent SLA, skip over sick or dead servers. Great example is that Dynamo system, 2007 SOSP, okay? The Dynamo system 
what you do is you write and it will find three servers to write to. And if one of them is slow or sick, it will keep going around the loop to find another one. So you can skip over making the change to a value to a server that has an old value, but by golly, you're going to write it three places. And when you read, 99 plus percent of the time, you'll find the new value and it's fine. One, you know, way less than 1%, you'll, you'll go and try again and you'll get the old value. You say, why would you do that? Well, because it always reads fast and it always writes fast. And it turns out there's business cases for which that's better. That's the, the major theme of this discussion. Okay, we're going to get there. So, in a non-linearizable store, fast predictable reads yes, fast predictable writes yes, read your writes no. Cached data offers scalable read throughput with great SLAs. If I'm updating a read value pair and I'm caching it across 100 servers, you guys aren't too surprised at the fact that sometimes I'll read the old value as it's updating the cache. That's to be expected and it's very valuable for certain business uses. It's actually not valuable for transactionally correct business state that you want to make sure you got the latest value, but it's really value for a lot of, valuable for a lot of other things. So scalable cache, fast predictable reads yes with scale, fast predictable writes not so much, read your writes no. So these are different stores for different uses. Is it okay to stall on a read? Is it okay to stall on a write? Is it okay to return a stale version? You can't have everything. So and there's a great paper, great blog article called Linearizability versus Serializability by Peter Bayless. So immutability, it's a solid rock to stand on. Sometimes we store immutable things. One example, just an example, is I got a bit pattern. It's associated with a UUID that's 128 bits. No other bit pattern will ever be associated with that unique ID. That means I cannot get an old value because there's no old value, there's one value. That's what immutability means. One identifier, one value, never changes with the value. Storing immutable things can change the behavior of the store. Because you don't ever get an old version, then you don't have to worry about all this read your write junk, right? So this is the slide, the picture from the previous slide. If I put immutable data on top of it, well, the linearizable store, it still reads your writes, but it's slow. The non-linearizable store gives perfect behavior for immutable data, perfect behavior, because it's fast, it's fast, it gives you the one answer, right? And scalable caches are fine, they work fine too, right? So interesting options with applications with immutable data. Non-linearizable gives fast and predictable writes and reads and does what you want. It's, a it's an immutable store. It gives you back the only answer for the data. And serial caches give you lots of fast and predictable reads. That's cool, interesting stuff. And as Alexi mentioned, there's a paper I wrote three or four years ago called Immutability Changes Everything, which talks about all sorts of quirky aspects of immutability. So session state, semantics, and transactions. Same process, different process. Honest to gosh, when I started working on databases, they were libraries running in the application. Okay, that's how it was. There was none of this cross-process stuff. And then we started to see that the application would trash the database, and maybe that wasn't so good. And then you started moving them into two processes on the same computer. So the database and app were split apart and connected by a session. And then you started to put the state on the session. Oh yeah, what, what user ID is this coming into this database? What transaction am I working on? What's going on? And that came across by decorating the ability to call another process in the same server in order to let the app be separate and to know how to keep the database straight. And this is, by the way, the heritage behind JDBC connections that you see today that are so common. So later still, the app and the database moved to different servers, so we were running them in a two-tier or an N-tier environment. Two-tier at this point, where you've got an app server's bunch of them surrounding a database server. Stateful sessions and transactions. So stateful sessions were the natural outcome of shared processes. It's like, you're gonna talk to me? Okay, you can talk to me again. We got this session. I know you're in the middle of the transaction. That's fine, send me another request on the session. That's cool, it's still in the same transaction. We'll go along for another 10 minutes. It's fine, whatever. We could do this stuff, right? You knew the, who, who the person was, you knew how it worked. They worked well for classic service-oriented architecture. A message is coming in from a distrusted party into an app server who is trusted, who is taking the message apart, scratching its head, saying, do I want to do that for that other partner? And then doing the work against the database. So you had the database was surrounded by the protectors of the application who were then dealing with other things. That's a classic service-oriented architecture. So here I have database one and database two. 
and I could have client one talking to app A, which was talking to app B, which is talking to database one. Now this is, I built the first one of these back at Microsoft. Client two is talking to app C, you've talked to app D again, back to those two, and if you're doing a transaction, you had to have distributed transactions. And Microsoft Transaction Server did this. The propagation of transaction state across sessions, across N tiers, was something that was cool and new in the middle of the 90s. I was very proud of it. It's worked out to be more brittle than I wish it were. And so it's not what people do today, because when things break, it kind of gets locked up. And so, but it's a very interesting, I'm proud of it. It was a lot of fun. So transactions, sessions, and microservices. So I now had an N tier system. Now all of a sudden we're going kind of gonzo with microservices. But microservices are cool, right? They stink when it comes to session state. They just do. That session state that we talked about breaks down now because I can't go across multiple servers. Usually you go back to the same microservice instance, but it doesn't always, and so you can't easily do a transaction. You need that session state to do a cross-request transaction. Let me say this again. If I want to send a request in the middle of a transaction, get an answer, and send another request in the middle of the same transaction and get an answer, I need session state to correlate those. I can't do that when the request is talking to microservice A, microservice instance number one, who's talking to the backend data, and then he gives me the answer, and now it goes to microservice instance number three, and off we go. That doesn't work well at all. It's very brittle. So microservices and transactions are typically one store request. So you get to the microservices and say, what am I going to do? I'm going to update the key value store. Great. That's great. But guess what? You don't end up with two-phase commit on that because it's really hard to make it work. Microservices are worth the restrictions. Fail fast, load balanced, health media deploy, canaries, rolling upgrades, fault tolerance. They're good. They're worth it. But now we have pushed microservices back into careful replacement of the key value store. So they're going to update value one, scratch their head, update value two, and the, the programmer has to reason about failure modes between them. I didn't say it's wrong. I said it's trade-offs. It said it's stuff we need to understand. So it's not your grandmother's transaction anymore. Transactions only work on a single call to the store. Scalable microservices, as the application microservices scale, more instances are made. As microservices compose, they call each other. Scalable stores, transactions across multiple identities, leads you to distributed transactions across stores, but that's a pain in the tush. Scalable linearizability, do I have per identity read your rights? Scalable non-linearizability, do I have per identity read one or more old versions? So let's talk about identity mutability and scale. What's identity? Each identity is represented by some number, string URI. I can talk about a specific New York Times for a, a specific date. I have an abstraction that's different, which is the gener generic today's New York Times. Each version of the identity is immutable. Once I go to today's date of the New York Times and the San Francisco region for the New York Times, I get a same bit pattern that will be forever, right? That's not today's New York Times necessarily, it's an immutable value. Version history may be linear. Version history may be a directed acyclic graph. This is what happens when you can't read your rights. This is, I always read the right, I wrote the new one, I read, read the old one, I wrote the new one. This is, I didn't get a chance to necessarily see the oldest one. I maybe saw the, the, the latest one. I saw one that was previous, and now when I'm writing this one, it's combining two things. And so you end up with the state of your data, and that happens. Cross-identity relationships. Using careful replacement across identities is tried and true. So if I do A first and I do B second, then I've got no window, which it's bad. Everything is good. I made sure that the update to B happened after the update to A. Careful replacement is predictable when the store behaves itself. If the store is not one that behaves itself, well, defined behave yourself is not linearizable, then the replication of stuff can mean that I get the window out of order. And so I can see this window here in the middle where these things I've updated this one before this one as far as I can tell when I'm looking at the replicas. And so your app will break. If your careful replacement workflow can't handle this being updated before that being updated, you just broke it by using a nonlinearizable store. And so that's a thing to consider. Careful replacement's buggy over nonlinearizable stores. Okay, let's dig into some app patterns. Careful replacement over key value. Objects are uniquely identified by their key. 
Workflow is captured. Scalable apps can be built over key value stores. This is what you do when you're working with another business. You're doing B2C. You're doing much of B2B. It depends which parts of it. But you're trying to make sure that the state is accurate. And so now you have your workflow. You try to manage all of that stuff in the time window. Careful replacement over key value is very valuable. Transactional blobs by ref. Imagine I have an app which is storing an immutable blob. I do a transaction to identify the blob. I copy a big document out into some store that holds immutable stuff. And then I do an answer. This could be a non-linearizable store because the data is immutable. And the blob is implemented with many commodity servers. And because it's non-linearizable, it's fast. This one's fun. Shopping carts. Nobody believes that multiple customers have to have transactional behavior across two shopping carts. That's not interesting. Right? You want to make sure each shopping cart is updated by itself. But it turns out that customers are very unhappy if the shopping cart stalls. You can measure e-commerce sites. You absolutely know if you take 10 seconds, 20 seconds, the customer is likely to go do the dishes and they won't buy something. If you give them back an inaccurate contents of the cart, they'll go, huh? And they'll fix the cart and she keep shopping. So it's actually much, much better to give an inaccurate shopping cart quickly than to give stall to get a accurate shopping cart. Shopping carts should be right now, even if they're not right. This is a tagline I want to introduce. Do you want your data right or do you want your data right now? Because you will design your systems differently for that. In a non-linearizable store, sometimes multiple old versions exist in the version history DAG. Sometimes you go back and you give an old one. So again, low latency predictable reads, yes. Low latency predictable writes, yes. Read your writes, no. Wrong shopping cart, rarely, but sometimes, yes. It's okay, meets the business need. Product catalog, feeds and creeds. Feeds and crawls processed by the back end. Big batch system. Getting information from merchants, getting information from manufacturers, creating the descriptions of products. Each product has a unique identifier. The identifier takes you to a partition. The partition takes you to a replica. The replica takes you to the product description. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So I read this stuff, I process it, and I'm plugging the data in there. The latency of updating the product catalog is not a big deal. Mostly it's okay. It's not like a two second stall is gonna matter. You're doing these big batch systems. User catalog lookups are latency sensitive. Incoming request comes in, product ID, figure out the partition, go to the partition, ask a replica. If he doesn't answer fast enough, ask another one. Do I care if it's racing with a concurrent product update, product description update? No. Do I care if I get a slightly old one? No. I care that I get one quickly and that is pretty good. So low latency predictable reads, yes. Writes, it's slow. Right? Read your writes, no. Lots of scale, lots of scale. Search is fascinating, especially for an old database guy who thought it had to be transactionally correct or it was evil. Right? I now know it's not true. It's okay to be non-transactional. Web crawlers search the index. the index. The updates to the index are not super latency sensitive. Very important search requests get low latency response. If you are a systems person, you should read this paper. The Tail at Scale by Jeff Dean and Luis Andre Barroso, Communications of the ACM, February of 2013. Fascinating how they do retries to bound the latency. But the retries, by definition, must be idempotent, which means it doesn't matter if you get the, the diff answer from a different server. It's really cool, really interesting. But they do this to make the reads fast. Remember, they have to hit all the partitions and get the search information back from all the partitions, so one laggard causes big latency problems. Fascinating issues for systems guys. Lots of scale. Conclusion, I'm trying to get through this so I'm not late. It's about the application pattern. So low latency predictable reads, writes, read your writes. Careful replacement, you don't really want to give the wrong answer because your workflow, your algorithm, your careful replacement stuff gets broken. So you wait to get the right answer. It's fine. I think it's important to recognize when you need that. Transactional blobs by ref is just one example of where the immutable storage of stuff can in fact be on a non-linearizable store, which is easier to manage, easier to do a lot of things, but gives you a really fast answer, but because it's immutable, it's never a wrong answer, ever. The worst that happens is you go to a server and it's not there, and you try another one, and then you get the one and only one answer that exists. E-commerce shopping cart, 
I want it fast, I want it fast, I want it fast, it's okay if it's sometimes wrong. It's great. E-commerce product catalog, I want to read it fast, I don't really care if I get an old version, let me know when it's a new version, it's not a big deal. Search, I really want fast predictable reads, I even want to do tricks to run to get multiple reads together, that's what that paper is about, I referenced you to, the, the tail at scale. Linearizable reads and read to writes are not always required. I want to say this again, I am a recovering transaction guy. I love transactions, but I think they have their place. Linearizable reads are not always required, depends upon what your business needs. Takeaways, state means different things. Session state, oh, by the way, I always do my, this slide first, the takeaway slide, this is what I hope you remember. Okay? State means different things. I have session state, I have durable state. Session states across running things, durable states across failures. Most scalable computing comprises microservices with stateless interfaces. Well, stateless interface means you don't remember anything when you go to another guy. It's okay, right? But they need partitioning failures, rolling upgrade, stateful sessions are problematic. Microservices co can call other microservices to get data or get stuff done. Transactions across stateless calls usually aren't supported in microservice solutions. I don't really know of any, frankly. Microservices means no server-side session state, which means no transactions across calls, which means no transactions across objects. Okay, let's move on, let's work with it. Coordinated changes use careful replacement technique for computing early days. Each update provides a new version with a single identity. Complex content within the new version has included many things, including incoming outgoing messages. Finally, different applications demand different behaviors. Do you want it right where you read your rights or do you want it right now bounded? Humans usually prefer right now to right. They usually would rather get a wrong answer quickly than wait for the perfect answer. That's usually. Many app solutions are bounded on object identity, have to be tolerant of stale versions, and immutable objects solve a bunch of problems. And so that is my last slide, other than the fact that I work at Salesforce, I like working at Salesforce, I, some of you would too. And so that's all I'm saying. <laughs> you can ping me if you want. So questions, do we have time for like, I'm like two minutes early, I'm sorry, I'm cutting it close. And so, do we have questions? I can repeat it if you want. Are you guys awake? I just make this stuff up. It's not my day job. Any questions? Any, anyone awake? <laughs> okay, sure, go for it. Thank you, Ben. Uh, great presentation. A lot of information process. I think folks are just, you know, sinking in slowly. Uh, so, what are the pain points in Salesforce? You're pretty well located there. What do you see there? You know, like, it's a very interesting architecture. It's federated data, it's like big data, which is agglomeration, like, actual, like small data. Can you give us some examples? We have lots of cool projects. I mean, I'm not an ML or AI guy. I'm not, although I'd like to learn more about what the plumbing's like for it. I'm not close to it. We're doing big data stuff. We're doing uh, database and infrastructure stuff. I mean, historically, our focus has been how do you do classic enterprise computing? Classic, don't make a mistake. Give it to people right. Give it to make, let people build their app. Um, I will tell you, look, my entire career, well, at least since 1982, has been focused on how do I do enterprise computing? And I define that as make it easy for the person who's not a computer science specialist, easy for someone who wants to think about insurance to build an insurance app. Right? And that means we have to do all the hard stuff underneath, for some definition of hard stuff. The insurance app's got its huge challenges too, but that I'm completely oblivious to. But making that easy. What's fascinating is doing that under scale. Right? So historically, the, the Salesforce scale challenge has been, we have lots and lots and lots of companies, each of which has got their own environment, and we have to support that correctly and run the, the, the data center and the support and the, st the storage and the, the disaster recovery and the failover and high availability, all that stuff's fun. Do that so people don't have to think about it. Now we're seeing new models coming in. You know, IoT is starting to influence things. We're seeing big data coming in and influencing things. And so um, I love both the change of the industry and I love the scale and frankly, Salesforce is a really nice, fun company to work for with good people, with good attitudes. I'll tell you, you know, going to work with people you have fun with, that makes a world of difference. And so that, that, that's kind of my answer. Did that, make, did that answer your question? Thanks, that was part of the sales pitch, that was great. <laughs> Any other questions? Come on, you guys, 
Y yes. Go ahead. I'll, I'll holler it out. You, you mentioned the distributed transactions at uh, Microsoft. So what was the, what, why is that approach never pursued as a scale? So, so I mentioned distributed transactions at Microsoft. Why is that a challenge? I first did two-phase commit in 1982 when I was at Tandem. And the individual servers there, when something broke, they kept going for a long, I mean, literally there was an 11-year mean time between failure for the entire company's install base of over 4,000 customers. Okay, and so I didn't see there that when a computer fails, how badly the distributed transaction causes other computers waiting for it to get locked up. So if you have a highly available component underneath a classic distributed two-phase commit, it can do okay, right? But if you have just your garden variety server, things are fine until they're not. And, and so that's where there has been pressure under that. And I wrote a little bit about that in 2007 in a paper called Life Beyond Distributed Transactions. I mean, they're very interesting things. I, could, I love talking. And there's some really cool and interesting technology. Spanner's interesting. There's a bunch of stuff that's interesting. But on a whole, it's, it's, you have to ask yourself what the trade-offs are. Did, did that make sense? Yeah, other questions? Yes. I mean, Spanner works great, but we're still trying to wait and see how well that works in terms of a readily available to the public protocol. I mean, they've been using it internally. Um, it, it's, it's fascinating, it's fascinating. Calvin's a fascinating protocol, but it's a form of optimistic concurrency control, which means you take a bunch of stuff and you say, is this gonna be okay without bumping into the, the edges? And you go and you put it against and did it bump into the edges? No, let's keep those changes. And it's really interesting, it's really smart, really cool. But optimistic concurrency control works pretty well when you don't have highly contended data. And that, but that's been true in a classic database when you have an N-tier database. So there's a, the discussions are broad and long. And I think we're going to continue to see an exploration in the space. It's a fun space. But, it's also, but I include in that space how do applications deal with maybe the store doesn't do it for them. So that's a broad space that includes both stores and application behavior on top. Did that, did that answer your question? Okay. Yes, in the back. Good. Uh, sorry, I have a question on the immutability. Um, like in non-linear uh, risable systems. So I'm a bit confused on kind of like the fast, how you can have fast reads and fast writes uh, with immutability. So I'm wondering like uh, when the application calls like a non-linearizable system uh, that does like immutability, uh, what if like, so you say like if one server doesn't have the answer, the correct answer, the immutable version, of that transaction, then uh, it'll call another server. But how would it like know that like one server is down? Like, what so, so, so me, I understand the question. Okay, when I say immutable store, what I mean is you never update a particular identity. So I have an identity for this document. It's got a really long URL or whatever, and there's never the old version. There's never the new version. There's only the one version. So now imagine if I have a store which doesn't have to do such correct stuff that you do when I'm updating. Pause for a sec. Let me go to the updatable linearizable store. So I've got a key value store. I'm updating value one to value two. I have to work very, very hard to make sure there are no value ones out there. So if, if one of my servers that has value one in its belly is down, I have to now reconfigure the system to never consider value one and never consider that server. And so that's hard and it causes me to take some time scratching my head to make sure that nobody is going to go back and get value one out of that down server. In the non-linearizable one, I would be willing to give you an old version if I'm storing version one and version two, if I'm storing it like that, sometimes I'll give you version one, most of the time I'll give you version two. But if one's down and it comes back up, the server's down and it comes back up, I, oh, here's the old one, what the hell? So if I do that, but I use it with stuff that doesn't have multiple versions, it kind of works. That's the observation. It, it, it kind of magically works because there's no old value. Did that make sense? So, yeah, that does make sense. So does that mean that, that if, uh, I guess like, 
if one server is like slow to kind of like write, create that immutable uh, version of it, then the in the application like it hasn't got the correct answer by the time. Like, well, if it if one's slow, then I just go to the next one. I have a really quick timeout. Okay. Really quick timeout. It's like ah, hey, he's taking too long. I'm going to the next one. Cool. And the probability of them all being slow is really, really, really low. Okay, I think it's time to wrap it up. Okay, thank you guys for everything. Thank you.